What if the food you're eating to keep you healthy might be making you sick? This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is Sally Norton. We're going to talk about toxic superfoods. It all starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio here in Southern California, Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and now on UK Health Radio all weekend long. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, I'm at the interview portion of our show with a very special guest. Today, we're going to talk about oxalates. What are oxalates? Well, you're going to find out. Our special guest is Sally K. Norton. She's an MPH. She's got a nutritional degree from Cornell, a master's in public health. Her path to become a le- becoming a leading expert on dietary oxalate includes her career in medical ed- education and public health research on her own behalf. She's gone through her own journey of healing uh, that led to this book called Toxic Superfoods. I've got it right here. How Oxalate Overload is Making You Sick and How to Get Better. And it's a fast, fascinating book. I went through it over the weekend and it's like, wow, I learned a lot because I've been on a healthy journey as your guy's guy. I've been out there trying my best to improve myself and you, there's always new things to learn. And sometimes you think you're doing the right thing, but then you find something like, well, maybe maybe you're doing a little bit too much of this. Like for instance, and we'll get into it, the move from dairy products to plant-based milks. And then I find out there's issues with almonds. And anyhow, Sally's going to get into all of that. We're going to talk about spinach, almonds, almond milk, sweet potatoes, celery, and other trusted plant foods, because your key to vibrant health may be quitting or cutting away on some of these so-called superfoods. And Sally's going to talk to us about that and how to kind of make the change and lead your best life possible, which is what we're all about here on Guys Guys Radio. So my very special guest, Sally K. Norton, MPH, Master of Public Health. The book is Toxic Superfoods, How Oxalate Overload is Making You Sick and How to Get Better. Welcome, Sally K. Norton. Thank you so much. We're going to have fun today. Absolutely. So, you know, eating well can be a paradox because uh, we we make so many changes doing our best to have the best health in mind, yet we sometimes find when we make one move, we've actually got to make two moves or three moves. So let's start out with this term oxalates. I I think a lot of people have heard of it. I've heard of it because I had kidney stones. So I know the whole path to oxalates and I've been going through a kind of uh, anti-oxalate protocol, which is coincidentally one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show. And we'll get into that, but let's start out for everybody out there. Tell us about what are oxalates? Why are they bad? It says here, it's a toxic compound harvested by plants for their protection, but they can damage cell metabolism and create nanocrystals. Talk, talk, Talk to us about oxalates, Sally. Yeah, so I, I would say to your audience that if you've never heard the word oxalate, you're not alone. I think most people have never heard of it. And it is really, you're lucky if you're a kidney stone patient and the doctor says, well, that stone is made of oxalate because usually they tell you it's made of calcium and everyone's worried about calcium, which is sort of the innocent victim in a crime committed by this compound oxalic acid, which makes these calcium crystals in, in nature quite easily. So um, plants need it for their survival. And um, some of the plants are so high in oxalate and other compounds that are toxic that we don't eat them. I mean, if you think about going outside and picking a salad and having a meal, it's hard to do because you know, you've been taught those are not edible. You have to go to this special place, the grocery store. And even those ones that we have, uh, the entire grocery store really that is all human invention, the, the produce department in particular came about through human uh, innovations, working with plants and, and making them into things that are more edible. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this oxalic acid is this irritating chemical that comes in different forms. You eat both the crystals and they're, they're little tiny crystals, <laughs> invisible. Some of them are shaped deliberately like a, a two pointed needles because they're defensive. When they, the plants del- deliberately build certain crystal shapes with oxalic acid and calcium, uh, for lots of reasons. And if we eat too much of the acid and, and the crystals, either one, they both have different kinds of damage to our bodies. The crystals, you don't really get into your bloodstream because they're too big to get into the body. They just abrade your, your throat and digestive tract with kind of like eating sandpaper all the time. <laughs> and But the acid is what gets into your body. And, and it, because it likes to crystallize, it likes to bind with minerals, it starts stealing minerals from your system and so on. 
Um, and it turns out that our fads and tendencies in, in eating over the last six, 600 years have increasingly added oxalate foods as familiar. And they're getting, those foods are becoming more and more available all the time. Things like dark chocolate, which was when we were kids, was kind of a rare thing that was a specialty thing that only weird gourmet people ate. <laughs> And now everyone's downing it. You know, there's a lot of things we've been doing in the last 50 years and even the last 15 that have accelerated our use of foods that are very high in oxalate. And it's increasing the numbers of people who are suffering because of the toxic effects it has over time. Let's get into uh, your personal story and how you came upon the discovery of the oxalate overload that you were experiencing and what you did, what the research you did and what you did about it to kind of change the uh flip the script on that yeah i've been trying to eat healthy since i was probably since i had my tonsils out at age five that was a pretty <laughs> unpleasant experience and and in the meantime beforehand i was being barred from the pool from swimmers ear and these things and i learned very early in life that your health matters a whole lot because if you're not healthy you don't have any fun and you know by seventh grade i knew if you're not healthy you don't have the career you want you don't have the family you want you like it can take away all the things you really want in life you can't build a life on a bad body. And so I've been committed to this idea of being a good kid in terms of eating right forever. So it was seventh grade when I decided to get my nutrition degree at Cornell. By the time I got there, I already knew the calorie counts of food and knew, I mean, I've been committed to eating well and it didn't go well. I started having additional health problems before I was you know, 12 or 13, I was already having arthritis and back pain and, and trouble concentrating and focusing in school. Uh, and it, it just, progressed on and off, on and off for years to the point where by 2010, or it was the end of 2009, I put in a resignation letter. I was a uh, faculty writing research grants in public health. And prior to that, I worked in integrative medicine, ran big federal grants um, at another medical school in North Carolina, uh, helping to bring holistic healing concepts into the curriculum, so we thought. Uh, and so I, I knew a lot of stuff, like I'm the teacher of teachers and the teacher of doctors and in this position in healthcare and public health. And I thought I knew my stuff. So of course I didn't know my stuff because we don't talk about oxalates in public health and, and in medicine much at all. So my leaving my career was hard enough. I needed a hysterectomy. I, I didn't recover well from that. I could no longer really read, get off the couch or really function anymore. Uh, certainly all this brain work, I didn't have it in me. And eventually I, I got sent to a sleep study and that sleep study led me on a three-year journey of figuring out why my brain won't sleep. It turned out my brain was waking up 29 times every hour. And when I finally got serious about really doing the low oxalate diet was in um, 2013. And what turned around for me was uh, a serious problems with my feet that, that actually caused me to leave Cornell to get foot surgery. And I spent a decade of my 20s on painkillers, crutches, wheelchairs, and in pain. In the next 20 something, 30 years, I couldn't go without shoes on. I couldn't really do athletics because my feet weren't great. And when I switched to diet, my feet, I can now run barefoot and, and I'm now turning 50. I started just before I turned 50. and. I, um, not only that, my sleep disorder disappeared pretty quickly and my brain fog started lifting and my osteoporosis in the next four years reversed itself, et cetera, et cetera. And my, you know, so many things got, I, I, that was so hard for me to imagine. How could all, I thought I had like dozens of problems. How, how did you, uh, pinpoint that, that oxalates were the culprit here? I was, um, uh, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to an outfit called the Volvar Pain Foundation, which is located in North Carolina, only like a half an hour from where I used to live. And I didn't know about them until I had this attack in 2009 of Volvar Pain. That is pretty darn unpleasant. It makes you want to cut off your genitals. <laughs> it's like not good. Yikes. <laughs> and my husband found it online for me because no husband wants a woman to threaten to cut off her genitals now, does he? <laughs> no. Or his. <laughs> Or his, and it, mm. both sexes will get pelvic syndromes of various kinds that involve, you know, scrotal pain, testicular issues, reproductive problems, um, urinary tract problems, frequent urination, nighttime urination, irritable um, bladder, you name it. it. It's not gender specific, but she was a woman mm -hmm. and this vulvar pain thing is a really aw awful thing to have. So it, I had been alerted to the fact that somebody thought 
oxalates was related to pain and arthritis and connective tissue problems. But it didn't make sense to me because I know stuff. So it can't be, I mean, I couldn't, I bought all her stuff and tried to learn it, but I didn't understand what I came to learn in my research and that it is not a specific problem in a specific part of the body for just certain people. It's a problem that it can affect any body part in any kind of way, very idiosyncratically at any point and looks different in different people and creates a toxicity syndrome in people that's hard to see. And that, um, took a lot of years of working directly with people and a lot of time in the library and a lot of time trying to piece together all the evidence. There's a tremendous amount to find, but it's scattered in the medical literature. No one's pulled it together mm -hmm. before this. Okay, well, the book is very well researched. Toxic Superfoods. My guest is Sally K. Norton, MPH, how oxalate overload is making you sick and how to get better. So we know that within plants, some plants have more oxalates than others. And there's a lot of uh, swaps we can make, but let's go into some of the the uh, villains here that we would not, the unsuspecting villains, for instance, that people have moved towards that think they're really good for you, but you have to be careful. And also later on, we'll get into the fact that uh, moderation is the key here because it's very tough with all this new learning to just change your diet instantly. And you give some really uh, thought out plans over 30 days, 90 days, whatever. But let's get into some of the, the specific foods, if you will, Sally, um, potatoes. You say potatoes have a lot of oxalates, not good for you. Sweet potatoes, even worse. And it's interesting because so many people are eating sweet potatoes th these days because they think they're healthy. I did that every day. <laughs> I used to be vegan. And in order to get out of the veganism, I had to get off the weed and the beans. And I started eating a sweet potato as my daily starch. And very quickly afterwards, I started getting sharp pains behind my shoulder blades at bedtime. And then I started getting age spots and wrinkles and all kinds of things. I never would in a million years, my sweet potato was my precious savior. It was a low allergy food that was had all this beta carotene and was innocent and sweet and delicious and held a lot of butter. And it was great. <laughs> no way was I going to kick sweet potato out of my life. I never put that together, unfortunately, because my body was already telling me and I couldn't hear that because we have all this cultural dogma clouding our own perceptions of our own experience. Let's get well, potatoes. Let's... I tell you, all my guys who have kidney stones are potato nuts, pretty much. Mm -hmm. if, if it's not the chips or the fries, fries right. it's the mashed or the baked. And it's it. you nowadays, you can hardly get through a day without either hash browns or fries or chips or something. Well, and kids, but... even the tater tots in school. I think potatoes are a big deal just because they're so ubiquitous. You have some swaps, so maybe we can touch on some of those. So for potatoes, you say turnips, cauliflower, rutabaga. Yep. Well, now, they're 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 also from the plant uh, family. Why don't they have the same oxalates? It seems like it's very uh, guess guesswork in terms of this one has a lot of oxalates and this doesn't. Exactly. Yeah, it does feel a little random, and we don't know much about uh, the plant kingdoms. We don't. We're not paying attention when they teach us that in biology 101. <laughs> so we don't walk away with the real intelligence about plants, but all of those plants that you mentioned, the cauliflower, turnips, and rutabaga are basically the same food because they come from the same mother plant of mustard. So that mustard family is the cabbage family or cruciferous family. Um, they're very promoted right now because of cancer. They as a group are quite low in oxalate. So many things like um, cabbage and and arugula and things that are from that family are very, very low in oxalate. That's some talent they did. I think it's telling that they really didn't exist in nature. We developed it from like a single mustard plant and somehow managed to come up with like 50 vegetables out of one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but that whole group is pretty safe. The broccoli okay. needs to be boiled to really be um, at its best. And Brussels sprouts probably reasonable portion, not John. People are now thinking more is always better. So you can't have an entire mountain of them, but a normal portion is great. Now, it seems like two of the real villains here are surprise, another surprise, uh, spinach and chard, which everybody seems to be eating these days. And you just mentioned something about uh, cooking preparation. Um, so I, I want to first hear about um, Spinach and chard, why are they bad? Why are they so high in oxalates? Uh, well, nature wants to know why they're bad too, because they're in the same, they're, um, chard is in, I think is the one that's, no, see, rhubarb and buckwheat are in the buckwheat family. The, um, it begins with an A, Ariashi family, that the, the beets, beet greens and chard is the same plant. So chard is basically beet without a beet. 
that they're worse than spinach. They're both off the charts, high in oxalate. And they researchers have been trying for 50 years to see if they can breed the oxalate production out of spinach and they can't pull it off. Uh, we don't really know exactly why some plants are getting by without oxalate because most plants need it in some form or another. For protection, right? Trees. Trees are making tons of oxalate. They, they grow in calcium soils and they have to excrete calcium. And so one of the clever tricks that trees do is they make these little blocky crystals and put it in the bark is it's kind of like pooping out calcium for them. You know, the bark will, will peel and shut off the trees. But that's that's so useful when you've got beetles and everybody trying to bore holes in you and your vascular tissue is right under the bark. So you need some kind of protection there. And so these blocky oxalate crystals, they're harder than your teeth. They're like quartz. So it's hard for a bug to get a nice hole in a tree when there's these crystals in the way. So the plants are doing lots of different things with oxalic acid to protect themselves from too much calcium and from invaders and eaters and stuff like that. So the bottom line is the oxalates in our bodies form crystals and the crystals then can get stored there or when they come out, if they come out, can come through your urinary tract and be very discomforting. And that's why people get kidney stones in the, the kidneys and the liver areas where they may accumulate. Um, they accumulate like, anywhere in the body, your salivary glands, your teeth, okay. your brain, your bones and bone marrow. And it comes in as an acid and, and when it forms crystals and then the body tries to break them down again, and then it comes back to acid again, and it goes to the kidneys and it grabs, it starts um, crystallizing in the kidney and in the bladder. So it's, it can crystallize anywhere. The body has a hard time breaking up the crystals, but, but makes an effort to kind of manage all of that. Okay. Let's get into some of the, you know, good, bad news, good news. So we had, you mentioned beet greens. How about like beets or beet powder? Powder. A lot of people put red beet powder in there smoothies and stuff is that bad or is it all, everything yeah, with beets it, is it, off the off the table or, it or, adds just, up. The, or it, just the greens it adds up where the beets need to be very carefully um um dosed out in in the context of what else you're eating so one portion of pickled beets or a, a teaspoon of beet powder you might be able to do that just fine of course your tolerance is depends on how leaky your gut is how much it gets into your bloodstream whether you're having it with cheese and dairy that can help reduce the absorption by a little bit. You know, there's lots of factors that affect how much you tolerate, but if the rest of your diet is full of almonds and potatoes, I would get rid of the beets. You know, it, it kind of depends on the overall sum total of what you're eating, not just the individual foods. It's a context. Okay. Some of the uh, good news, bad news, uh, peppers. So I believe you say that red peppers are okay. Uh, green peppers and yellow peppers are not good and black pepper is bad and white pepper is good. So there's so many of these things where it's a lot to memorize for people to kind of get a handle on it. So I suggest everybody pick up Sally's book, Toxic Superfoods, but talk to us about some of those, you know, good news, bad news uh, plants like peppers. Yeah, so the peppers is um, in the same family, the sort of nightshade family and Solanaceae family, and they their potatoes are in that group and eggplant, and um, they're all kind of variable, the, the different ones inside the family. So it's interesting that the red, the ones that ripen red are really ripe. The green one is an unripe pepper and unripe things like the black pepper is an unripe pepper and unripe avocado, like unripe fruits are higher in oxalate. I think the plant's trying to tell you, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me until it's ready to have the seeds mature because your job as someone coming to steal the fruit from a plant is to distribute the seeds for the plant. This is the deal. You get paid to distribute my seeds with this lovely fruit if you wait until it's ripe. And so the plant needs this time, this maturity time, not only to develop the seed so that it's a fertile seed, but also to um, you know, work with its physiology and, and use up those oxalate crystals. They build lots of oxalate crystals in the seeds and the plants when they're as they're young. And sometimes some of these plants use them as they age. So that's um, a little confusing though. We don't have all the answers. It's not like we really get nature. We, we, we're so unhumble. We think we know everything. <laughs> it's like, right. maybe we should stop and listen to nature for a minute. And, and I think we've also... We modern people have been marketed and been told, you need this for yourself. You deserve this. We, we have such an entitlement attitude about consumption. Like we should be able to have whatever we want. And it's turning us into like spoiled kids. Like are we not realize we need to respect nature and have a little humi humility in the face of what's good for us, what's not good for us. Listen to mother nature. She's our mother. 
she's trying to give us clues and we're not listening. And I think some of that is because our modern attitude is so entitled that you can have whatever you want. Let's get into um, uh, things like other things like chocolate. We have chocolate, cacao, cocoa powder, um, and carob. They're kind of on the thumbs down. Oh, yeah, this very bioavailable. I mean, that means the oxalic acid in cocoa and dark chocolate get into your blood very easily. Um, and they're so popular now. And the more watery it is, like with the hot cocoa approach to it, you're, it's more available to get into your bloodstream. So the darker the chocolate, the more oxalate. If you do white chocolate and cocoa butter, there's no oxalate in the fatty portion because oxalate is technically a water soluble molecule. So like olives have some oxalate, but olive oil has none. Peanuts have a lot of oxalate, but peanut oil has none. So if you go out to eat in an Asian restaurant using peanut oil, you don't need to worry about it because it's there's no oxalate in the oil. So same with chocolate. The, the more fat and sugar in it, the less oxalate, the darker, the more oxalate. How about, uh, pe you mentioned peanuts. How about, uh, you know, organic Valencia peanut butter? Because I love peanut butter and I was... But what I've read is that's kind of the only, if you're going to eat peanuts, you better be eating 100% Valencia organic peanuts. So I have a spoon of uh, peanut butter with some raw honey every morning. And it sounds like maybe I need to cut back on that peanut butter. Yeah, the things that become our daily rituals become our daily toxicity dose. <laughs> <laughs> so what's wrong, wrong with peanuts? Well, peanuts have a lot of problems. And peanut they're butter, high, peanut butter. High in lectins, they're prone to molds and they're very high in oxalate. It's very bioavailable oxalate. You know, in my research, I learned that um, the only reason we grew peanuts initially was to feed the pigs, that they were pig food in the South. And it was after, well, during the uh, Civil War that they were desperate in the Southern side of the war to feed their soldiers. And so they just like, well, the only thing we got left are these peanuts. So let's see if we can make the soldiers eat these darn peanuts. Mm -hmm. And after the war, turning peanuts into human food was part of the um, rebuild the economy strategy that um, was agreed so, upon at the uh, federal so, level. So for something like peanut butter, uh, instead of just completely cutting out, is there a safe amount that people can consume. I mean, you have a you have a level of 150 to 200 milligrams of oxalates a day. That's a very low level. You can you can blow through that very quickly. Uh, and yes. you have you have different levels of toxicity in terms of acceptable and then higher and then even higher. Yeah. With 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 people in in moderation, some of these foods, let, let's say like peanut butter, can they just have to like eliminate it? No more peanut butter, or can they have a little bit? The same thing with you know chocolate or. Uh, tomatoes you mentioned are not good. And then people say, oh, lycopene, that's good for men. And then it's like, no, it's not good for you. It's very confusing. It is confusing. And so a chocolate chip cookie that has like six chocolate chips in it is fine. But a piece of you know flourless, deep, dark chocolate cake, I mean, you get like half a bite of that. So it's a matter of the concentration and sort of a dilution factor going on. But I, I'm really concerned about the overuse of nuts like peanuts, almonds, cashews, and so on, and seeds like chia, which are very high in oxalate, uh, sesame, R2, and so on, a hemp. These, these things are seeds. These are the babies of the plant. They're very well defended by the plant to made inherently to be indigestible. So if you decide to eat it, you basically are meant to poop it out with fertilizer, not actually digest it. So they're hard on your digestion. And Fundamentally, too many of the lectins that are in a lot of these things and too many of the oxalates will ultimately ruin your digestive tract, which is like getting you in the gut, really. I mean, your immune system, nervous system, your protection from the outside world is all depends on gut health. And so you don't want to like really make foods that are designed to be indigestible and designed to harm your gut, which a lot of these plant toxins do. That, that's the other surprise from my research is I studied lots of plant toxins that are in food plants that we eat. Because initially I was going to include that whole discussion to kind of explain, hey, plants are inherently toxic. I didn't put it in the book because the book needed to be not too long. But uh, all of these toxins hurt the gut. And so in my book, in the back, I have something called a dosing table that tells you how much you can have of certain foods to reach a certain target of oxalate. And I didn't even put the nuts and seeds in the dosing table because I, for anyone who's got health concern enough to really be doing a good job with their oxalate watching, they really need to be cautious about seeds and, and uh, nuts like peanuts, mm -hmm. which is a bean legume type thing. And sure. the beans aren't so good either. The black bean burrito, 
you know, it's interesting because I we have a uh, uh, mung bean soup all the time, and uh, that's a her, low oxalate food. That's what I was reading. I was surprised. I'm like, I wonder where mung bean is because I had a a guest on the show, Dr. Clint Rogers, and he worked with this famous Indian uh, doctor, and um, they were singing the praises of mung bean soup as well as some folks I know who know the these people, and I. I uh, have been having it and feel fantastic. So it was nice to see that mung bean is separate, but what, what makes a mung bean different than a lentil, if you will, or a black bean? This is something for botanists to figure out and understand the plant physiology and what the plants are doing with them. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of money in botany research. So getting all those kinds of answers would require us to care as a society enough to fund that kind of research. And and they, they have been, you know, some cool research happens in botany about this, but they need more funding to answer those kinds of smaller questions. My question for you is, is the mung beans sprouted? Are they soaked? How, sprouted, are they, yeah. How he cooked? Yes. You made sprouts, you make mung bean soup with sprouts? Yeah. The, yeah. the mung so, beans have, you wait till you put them in water and then they sprout and then you cook them. Yeah. So with beans that are, with the, the beans and, and, Peas that are low oxalate include black eyed peas, green peas, and chickpeas, but there are still legumes and all these legumes are safer if they're soaked for like three days mm -hmm. and then high heat cooked, really high heat. And that disarms the lectins, which is another get you in the gut kind of toxin. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, there's choices there in the legume department, but this, the list is a little bit shorter than the one you're used to. How about with the, the chia seeds? If you take chia seeds, uh, because I've read, you know, that they're power packed. They're a good protein source. I don't eat meat. I haven't eaten meat in 14 years and I'm, I'm not going back. I feel much better from not eating meat. Um, but I soak the uh, chia seeds in the, in the liquid before I, before I blend it. So I, they're sitting in there for a couple hours and then I'll do the blending. But it's, can, with some of these uh, high oxalate foods, uh, soaking them in water, does that extract any of the oxalates out of them? <clears throat> Not in the case of the seeds. It what it does, what soaking does for seeds is it activates the germination process. And one of the reasons the seed has the oxalate in it is not just because it forms a protective coating, kind of similar to the tree bark concept, where it puts mm -hmm. these really tiny crystals in the outer roll, roll edges of the seed, is it it now starts breaking down the ox calcium oxalate crystals so it can use the calcium to be a cofactor in enzymes. And what you get. On the other side of that breakdown is oxalic acid, and it doesn't necessarily leach out of the seed, certainly not in a day soak. Um, and what it does is now gives you more oxalic acid, so it increases the bioavailability and probably makes it more toxic, not less. It's just absolutely fascinating. The name of the book, again, Toxic Superfoods, How Oxalate Overload is Making You Sick and How to Get Better. Sally K. Norton, my guest on Guys Guys Radio. I'm really loving this conversation. Let's... Uh, we talked about uh, leaky gut a little bit. We touched on that. And a lot of folks, I think, have leaky gut uh, partially because they take these NSAIDs. Is that is that true? And uh, with the oxalate, um, what can they do in terms of the relationship to oxalates if they're having leaky gut syndrome or irritable bowel syndrome or other things like that? And people have, pro people have problems with their GI tract, let's face they it. They really do. And oxalate is famous for being a promoter of gastrointestinal problems. In fact, when this was first defined as a health problem where you're making yourself sick on eating high oxalate foods, which was in 1842, the way they defined the illness was that person always had gut problems. Plus they had some kind of neurological problem like a mood disorder or suddenly becoming weird and OCD or whatever, or depressed. And, or they had some kind of connective tissue, rheumatic type pain in their elbows or their wrists or something. So the gut was part of the core definition because they were seeing things like obstruction type constrictions in the gut and so on. And then there's this whole um, dysbiosis and this leaky gut. And now between antibiotics and drugs, every drug we take has a potential to be stressful on the intestinal tract and the kidneys and the liver. Um, and the NSAIDs are things like ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, and so on. They are well documented to be quite terrible for your gut. But if you start having rheumatism and stomach pains, people run and take this stuff and <laughs> get in this cycle. And right exactly. now we're in a world that's hurting. We have opioid addiction, painkiller addiction, suicide rates up. Uh, 
mood problems galore and, and learning disorders and people are struggling and toxicity and deficiency are really the only way to explain this kind of meltdown of our function that's going on. And oxalate is just like this ubiquitous stuff that we're doing every day, doing things that are becoming more and more normal as is eating high oxalate foods is becoming more and more normal. And, you know, we have to start being willing to question what we accept as normal in our food to be able to address these things that are becoming so disruptive to our lives, our families, our communities, our let's economy. Talk, let's, let's talk about uh, well stated, Sally. I mean, you, you really, it's, it's fascinating. It's provocative. And it's, it's something that people really need to think about this because I thought I was eating healthy and this is a game changer for me. Um, one of the things, and we're, we're pretty on it. Um, one of the things we've done, uh, because I had a, a kind of urinary tract, kidney stoneish type thing coming on uh, over the holidays and I was away and I was like, this is not good. And um, we came home and we started doing a cleanse where we take uh, a, a little bit of potassium citrate, magnesium citrate, and activated charcoal in two like uh, 16 ounce uh, glasses of water every morning. I've been doing it. Some people do dry January. Well, I don't drink alcohol, so I'm doing this cleanse. And then afterwards, a couple hours after, we squeeze lemons and drink through a straw, shooting it kind of at the back of our throat so it doesn't affect your teeth, and um, and then swishing with uh, with uh, some salt water. But that seems to be making a difference. It'll make you, it's actually changed the shape of my body. And I'm, all, I'm on day 29 now, I think. Um, it pulls everything out, obviously, when that goes into you, it pulls everything out. But can that help in terms of taking the oxalates out of your body also when you do some type of a cleanse? You're talking about citric acid, citric acid in the lemon and citric acid in the supplement, the, the magnesium and the potassium. These are key remedies that I recommend in my book and with my clients because citric acid uh, helps to bind to these oxalate crystals. It actually weakens the crystals and turns them from something that has a texture that's like quartz to something more like chalk because actually the molecular bond between citric acid and calcium is slightly stronger than the bond between oxalate and, and calcium. So that, that, that whole crystal is softened. That's a great big help for you if you have crystals anywhere, especially in the urinary tract. High uh, citrate excretion protects your kidneys from kidney stones and protects them generally. Citric acid is also turned into bicarbonate to a small degree in your liver after you consume it. So that lowers the acidity. And two of the big effects of oxalate are stealing your minerals and causing acidity and the uh, acidity and mineral loss both cause problems like osteoporosis in the long run, but that is so dangerous to be in an acidic state. And it just doesn't make you feel good too. When you're going kind of acid and your system's struggling and starting to dissolve your bones again and again, because the bones are this reservoir of sort of chalky calcium that they can use to squelch down the acid. Cause you try your lungs try to get rid of acid and everybody's trying to help, but it gets to be too much. So the citric acid is really, really helpful uh, with this oxalate poisoning problem and help you to reverse the problem. So I have no doubt that you feel better because you're yes. correcting acidity in the body. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about meat a little bit because so many people have, and you were a vegan, have kind of moved away from meat. And uh, I'm a pescatarian. I have been for 13 years now. I feel great. And I, I my body, I went through a... Um, I had some problems, detox problems when I stopped eating meat. And I decided because of that, I would never go back. And then I started to empathize with the animals a bit. And then also reading about all the conditions and the things that the animals are giving when it's a farmed, you know, farm product, if you will. Um, what can people do? What's your, what's your take on meat? And what can people do who want to get the protein, but don't want to go back and don't want to eat meat? Well, you really need to just... Think about what your high oxalate foods are initially and just work on that and see and, and listen to your body. I think fundamentally we have to like get over our opinions as much as we can and start asking your body what it really needs. And because that can be tricky. I mean, the fish is a great idea. Omega threes can so help the brain, help you build muscle, it can really improve um, mood and your attitude a lot. So I really love the fish thing a lot. And, and some people, need red meat. The red meat offers a lot of um, nutrients that we need. And that's makes sense because 
we were here for a million years uh, during the ice age and so on, basically hunting woolly mammoth and large animals until we kind of ran them out, out of <laughs> into extinction. And uh, now we, we still rely heavily on ruminant animals. So I don't eat beef myself anymore. Oxalates mess up your gut enough that you can become allergic to even beef. And so um, there's lots of ways to go, but I, protein is really, really helpful. And the older you get, the more important it is. And most people are not eating enough protein. So I wouldn't discourage someone from eating meat if they like it, um, because fundamentally it's more humane to have your my farmer friends an hour away loving on the cow they sell to me to buy versus these monocultures of almonds and and soybeans and wheat are so destructive to the to the ground it's so destructive to use plows like that it kills so many animals who try to make those fields their homes there is a bloodbath in these fields of of soybeans so i don't feel like you're killing less souls if you eat beef. I don't think there's a good argument for that. I think that's just been kind of a ideological try to emotionally sway people. I prefer to think from the body's perspective and try to support it much as you can and be open to experimenting with more foods. I mean, some people, they need a certain kind of fat that animals provide. I really like to see people using butter. It, it has a lot of good nutrients in it, but you want to use good quality fats. You want to care about how they're produced, not just because of the humanity piece, which is spiritually important, but from a nutritional and physical point of view, you want nice, clean fats that are have good nutrients in them. Mm -hmm. And that's all important because in the long run, the way if you kind of, it's a slow food movement kind of attitude. If you care about how your food is raised and you know who raised it and under what conditions, this is what's going to rebuild our rural economies because we're going to go back to family farms and stop having industrial scale production of any kind of food. And this sort of factory mindset about food is ultimately what's killing us, whether it's animal food or junk food, it can all be just this industrial vision that's all technology is going to be give us all the convenience we want and we can be spoiled kids instead of actually being thoughtful citizens of the planet let's let's talk about um supplementation ba based on the fact that a lot of the food that we do get out of so uh, soil now the soil's not that uh, vibrant as it used to be the animals aren't eating uh, who are factory raised if you will aren't eating very good diets and they're beginning get given additives so supplementation seems like it's something that we need to consider now you're good on some supplements and not so good on other supplements. So vitamin C, you have a little warning light on that. Um, your thumbs down from what I've read on turmeric, um, even if it's with the black pepper. Um, Especially so if it's with the black pepper. Okay, so talk to us about that. Talk to us about some um, supplements. Let me just, What's good, just what, what are? Round out your comments about uh, nutrients and today's food. I, one of the big things that people don't remember is that our water used to be sourced from streams and wells and from the ground and be loaded with nutrients and minerals. And water used to be our prime source of minerals. But now water is recycled toilet water with traces of antidepressants in it and like nothing good with additives in it. So water is really key in a place where supplementation matters. So I talk about that in my book too. Like you can take highly purified water, which you need to do because there's toxins in the, in the public water, but replace minerals in it because you're missing out on minerals and oxalate creates a mineral deficiency devastation and to drink really purified water without minerals just adds to that mineral deficiency problem so that's just to finish that conversation about how bad modern food is in terms of nutrients water is probably the worst problem we're facing and the most almost invisible to people because okay. we don't think so, about water as a source of nutrients so alkaline water uh, we have a place up here i'm in carlsbad california that has a natural well that's been around for like a hundred years and we go up there and we fill up it's like a dollar a gallon and we drink, except after meals, we drink this alkaline water all the time in an effort to get clean water and also to lower our uh, acidity. Is that a good idea for people? That is probably a very good idea, especially if they test the water and reassure you that it mm -hmm. doesn't have yeah. any lead or other, uh, um, you know, either natural or unnatural contaminants in it is excellent. And you can add vinegar to water when you drink it. It actually tastes a little better when it's got, and so you can bring it up to neutral and still get the alkalizing benefits of minerals. So it doesn't always have to like hit your stomach in an alkaline state to be um, alkalizing. How about collagen? A lot of women today are taking more collagen supplements. They want to stay young. 
what's your uh it just puts them at a risk of hyperoxaluria is that what it's called and, and yeah so hyperoxaluria that... hyper means high mm -hmm. oxo is referring to oxalate and urea is referring to urine or the urinary tract so high oxalate in urine is what hyperoxaluria means and that's how medicine defines it and, and diagnoses it as they measure the oxalate in your urine, which is rarely done. Um, but that causes, like eating too much oxalate, eating too much collagen can also turn into oxalate. So this is called endogenous production when the collagen amino acids, particularly one called hydroxyproline, turns into oxalate in the body. So we can handle up to, you know, a scant tablespoons worth of say gelatin equivalent, which might be two cups of broth. Um, depends on how much gelatinous amino acids are in your broth, but too much of these collagen powders is definitely increasing oxalate production in the body. Vitamin C is a similar problem. You eat the vitamin C and that is a precursor to oxalate as well. When there's extra hanging around, it tends to degenerate into oxalate in the body. And this tends to have, if you're doing it with supplements, well, the body only needs 100 milligrams a day. And if you're really sick, you might need 400 milligrams a day. But a lot of people are taking a gram, five grams, eight grams. They're taking huge amounts of vitamin C, none of which your body can do anything with because you only have so many white blood cells to pick up the C and make any use of it. That extra tends to degenerate into oxalate and people can um, end up filled with oxalate um, deposits from vitamin C. And then when you quit it, can go on a kind of a, an oxalate hangover where they start having to now excrete the oxalate created by the high vitamin C. And it's so interesting in the literature because it shows that people who take supplements of vitamin C and vitamin E end up living shorter lives and have more health problems because this is blowing away the cell's ability to control their own, what we call redox balance, how much oxidative stress the cell has, it wants to control, but you're throwing so much C at it, it's throwing the whole system out of whack. Okay, we're running out of time, but I wanna make sure we uh, get to your information, but also what are what can, most people are, they're still not gonna know if they're high in oxalates or not. What can people, our listeners out there and viewers do as a first step to say, okay, I, I know these are the good foods. These are not so good foods, oxalate wise. What can they do to kind of get started in terms of the healing path, if you will? Well, I have uh, some resources on my website, including this evaluation tool that's also in the book that looks at your risks, your exposure to oxalate. So there's a list you can check off. Have you been eating these either now or in the past? You know, did you like, did you get into a homemade almond milk habit 10 years ago that you just went slamming hard on it or whatever? And then- this is kind of symptoms that show up, which can be all kinds of things. And if you have any anything going on in those departments of leaky gut, renal problems, high exposure, and health problems, then you definitely want to start thinking about, well, what have I been eating now? And what can I start getting rid of? And one at a time, you know, I, I could live without chard. I was a little bit um, reluctant about the sweet potato thing and went on and off of them and talk about that a little bit in the book. But um, you don't have to do it all at once. It's better not to. So, you know, save that little peanut butter thing to, to be like your last thing that you change. Got it. Okay, great advice. The name of the book, Toxic Superfoods, Sally K. Norton, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio. I tell you what, Sally, I'm going to go and follow your protocol as best I can for a couple of months. Then I'm going to invite you back on the show and tell you how I feel. And if I'm, if I'm a happy camper, because I've experienced some of these oxalate issues for real. And when you have a kidney stone, you remember it. So- I'm going to make that invitation to you. If you want to come back in a couple of months, we'll talk about it. I'll see how I'm doing. I'll, I'll track it. And also in the meantime, tell everybody about your website and uh, so they can find out more about you and start to get to work on this oxalate issue right away. Oh, I'm so happy that we're going to do a low oxalate for Robert. <laughs> so, <laughs> so great. We're going to have fun. I'll talk to you in two months. In the meantime, everyone can find me at my website, which is sallyknorton.com, sallyknorton.com. The other Sally Norton is not me. So remember the little K and then you can reach out to me there. I'm on Instagram too. If you want to see stuff there, I have two accounts on Instagram, but my website's the best place to reach me. So yeah, come, come join the party of feeling better. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on guys, guys radio. I'm going to see you in a couple of months, Sally. Can't wait. Enjoy the guests and content. I bring you each and every week to guys, guys radio and guys, guys TV. Please support us by subscribing to our channels. Thank you.